I'm Sarah Grandin, Clark Getty Paper Project Curatorial Fellow. And along with my colleagues at the Clark, I am preparing an exhibition of 18th century French works on paper from the Bibliothèque Nationale de France that will debut at the Clark in December of 2022. In France in the 18th century, the public appetite for drawing by contemporary artists exploded. Drawing had long been privileged by art aficionados as a direct, unmediated way to access an artist's identity. And in 1648, after the founding of the French Royal Academy for Painting and Sculpture, learning to draw became a pillar of artistic instruction in France. In the 18th century, artists began to draw at an accelerated pace. And they began to think about the commercial potential of drawing. To satisfy the growing demand for drawings, editors and artists sought to reproduce and multiply these original works on paper through the medium of print. Through their editorial endeavors and their technical innovations, drawing became accessible to a greater audience and even influenced the way artists drew. Through an examination of a selection of drawings, prints, and books from the collection of the Clark Art Institute and from its library, we will explore the primacy of drawing in 18th century France and learn about the vital role that print played in propelling the popularity of the medium. Let us begin with a look at this print by Parisian engraver Jean-Jacques Flippard, which plunges us into the world of the French Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture. In the 17th and 18th century, the Academy was housed in the Louvre Palace. This is a studio where artists in training would have learned to draw. In 1759, the antiquarian and amateur etcher, the Comte de Quelus, was concerned that artists were no longer capable of capturing facial expressions with adequate fidelity. So we launched a competition called the Concours pour le prix de l'étude des têtes et de l'expression, the prize for the study of heads and expression. The walls of the studio are covered with académies, studies of male nudes drawn from life. This was also central to academic training in France. Our next drawing takes us to Italy. In this beautiful red chalk drawing, we see the hermit's court of the Colosseum in Rome. The most promising young artists of the French Academy had the opportunity to travel to Italy to further sharpen their skills as draftsmen. This was the case for Jean-Honoré Fragonard, who won the Prix de Rome and then spent several years as a pensionnaire at the French Academy in Rome. He was apparently a terrible student, loath to complete his assignments, but he blossomed as an artist when given the opportunity to draw en plein air, which is the case of this study. We can see in this beautiful drawing his sensitivity to the movement of light through foliage and to the diverse textures he could observe in ruins. He captured these details by subtly altering the pressure he applied to the piece of red chalk he held in his hand. We know that when he drew this setting, he was accompanied by his friend Hubert Robert because a very similar drawing by the artist Robert exists. Another interesting detail of this drawing lies in the signature and the date. There's a spelling mistake in Fragonard, which is spelt Flagonard, which you know is a mistake that the director of the French Academy in Rome, Charles-Joseph Natoire, often made. This detail tells us that this drawing was likely in Natoire's personal collection or that he sent it back to Paris as proof of Fragonard's progress. The next album of drawings we will look at keeps us in the Italian countryside. This album of drawings is one of the treasures of the Clark collections. It contains drawings made by Guillaume Letier that he made during his travels in Italy in the late 18th century. The album was assembled posthumously by one of his most beloved students, Mélanie Marie d'Ervilly. We have townscapes and tree lines rendered in pen and ink and brush and wash, cacti and botanical gardens rendered in strokes of graphite, and even landscapes done in black chalk with white highlights on pristine blue paper. For those who didn't have access to study of the live model at the Academy in Paris or to trips to Italy, print was an essential resource for learning how to draw. Professionals were not the only people who learned how to draw in France in the 17th and 18th century. Princes, princesses, and other children born into privilege also received drawing instruction. This volume from the Clark Library gives us insight into the lessons that were given to the Duc de Bourbon, 
Louis XIV's son. This publication shows us that students were supposed to begin with contours of trees and landscapes, and then fill in the forms with more hatchings to give an impression of volume and tone. This technique was to be applied not only to trees and landscapes, as in this volume, but also to human figures and equestrian subjects. In 1755, the editor Charles-Antoine Jombert published A Method for Learning How to Draw, which was exceptional in the degree of written detail it provided. Accompanying his detailed text were plates reproducing drawings by old masters from Charles Lebrun to Raphael. Most of these illustrations focused on human expressions, gestures, body parts, human proportions, and they reproduced Académie, those studies from the live model that students at the Academy produced. Now let's leave these drawing manuals behind and dive further into the relationship between print and drawing in this period. In 1721, the painter Jean-Antoine Watteau died at the age of 37. During his short life, he produced somewhere between 2,000 and 4,000 drawings. After his death, his friend and patron, Jean de Julienne, commissioned an immense editorial project to translate a large part of the artist's drawing corpus into print. This publication was called Figures de différents caractères, Figures of Different Characters, and was published in two volumes between 1726 and 1728. The publication is commonly referred to as the Recueil Julienne. But why would Julienne have gone to the trouble of producing, reproducing so many of his friends' drawings? Well, Watteau was a magnificent draftsman, as we can see in this beautiful drawing from the Clark's collection. Figures observed at different moments from surprising angles seem to waltz around each other on the page, politely jostling for space. As they turn their heads, or as their profiles disappear from view, we are struck by Watteau's interest in capturing the ineffable, inaccessible inner world of his subjects. This melancholy picture of a woman draped in black was one of approximately 350 that Julien chose for transcription into etching. Now, there are many theories as to why Julien would have undertaken this huge project, as it was very expensive. And one theory is that it was to enhance the value of the drawings. To this end, the Recueil Julien can be viewed as a giant marketing ploy. Of the many etchings in the Recueil Julien, François Boucher produced over 100 of them, including that of the woman in black and this dynamic portrait of a woman in profile. In fact, making these prints was Boucher's principal activity for several years before he too went to Rome to study and before he became one of the most prolific and successful artists of the century. Just as Boucher was instrumental in preserving Watteau's graphic legacy, so was Watteau a powerful influence on Boucher's development as a draftsman. Here, this life study in black and red chalk of the head of a young girl by Boucher recalls the oblique angles from which Watteau observed his subjects. Drawings very similar to this were reproduced in print with Boucher's permission during his lifetime. While Watteau had no say in the commercial afterlife of his drawings, Boucher capitalized on print's ability to replicate his drawings and augment his income. Boucher enjoyed another privilege, that of having his drawings translated using a new print medium, that of crayon manner engraving. This allowed the printmaker to not only translate the contours of Boucher's figures, but also to capture the texture of the traces he left in chalk. This print by Gilles de Marteau is an interpretation of one of Boucher's red chalk drawings. This print by Gilles de Marteau was based on a drawing by François Boucher, and it employed a new technique of which de Marteau was one of the inventors. De Marteau used toothed roulettes and textured matoirs on his copper plates, which left marks that were the width and grain of strokes of greasy crayon on laid paper. There are two telltale signs that signal you are looking at a crayon manner engraving and not at a drawing in crayon. The first is the cuvette, or plate mark, which is the indentation left in a piece of paper after it has gone through the copper plate press. This mark has been cut out of this print, unfortunately. The second is the orientation of these strokes in the background. The strokes of a right-handed artist would ascend diagonally from left to right, but this is reversed in the printmaking process, as we can see here. 
As we will see in this next print by Demarteau's nephew, the young Demarteau took the additional step of reversing the gestures of his own hatching in the background of his print, so that when the print was pulled, the orientation of the lines would look like they had been freshly drawn. This large, remarkable print is a virtuoso counterfeit of a drawing in red, black, and white chalks by François-André Vincent, now at the Albertina. Most connoisseurs would have known they were looking at a print, not a drawing, but Demarteau still made every effort to impress the viewer with his imitative skills. He made the image using three plates, each of which was printed using a different color, one in black, one in red, and one in blue ink. Like his uncle, Gilles Antoine de Marteau had trouble printing with white ink, and so he worked the black plate to impart a gray tone that gave the appearance of buff paper. The appearance of white highlights we see around her neck came from the careful reserve of the paper itself, where no ink was printed. The blue border is not a real frame, but an impression of one that looks much like contemporary blue mats, and the red lines imbue warmth into the woman's pious visage. These complex prints by the Demarteau are a testament to the appetite for drawing in 18th century France. They also show us that consumers were not merely interested in images, but in the material specificity of drawing itself, to the play of chalk, pastel, or wash on a piece of paper, and to the index of an artist that these pools of ink and strokes of chalk registered. The method of Cran Manor engraving, which was highly labor-intensive, soon fell out of favor to be replaced by easier, cheaper methods such as lithography. And by the late 19th century, photomechanical means of reproduction became available to artists and editors. But taking the time to look at these prints and drawings gives us an opportunity to appreciate the art of imitation and to ponder on the enduring pull of works on paper. To view more prints, drawings, and photographs from the Clark Collections, please come visit us at the Thaw Galleries, where we regularly have rotations of works on paper, or make a private appointment at the Manton Study Center for works on paper. Finally, you can visit clarkart.edu to explore our vast collections of prints, drawings, and photographs. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sarah Grandin, for that spectacular tour through some of the treasures of our collection. Um, it's been lovely to hear you um, illuminate them for us over the last few minutes. And it's also just been lovely to see you discovering the collection over these past months and now hmm, year and a half or so of your um, Getty Paper Project Fellowship. So um, the, I understand that you have some more uh, insight to share with us about printmaking techniques in particular. So um, before you do that, I just wanna uh, invite our audience to uh, put any questions that may have come to mind during Sarah's presentation uh, into the Q&A box and we will get to them after uh, a look at some, a closer look at some print techniques. So I'll turn it back to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Anne, for that warm introduction. And thank you all uh, for being here during your lunch hour or morning coffee or wh wherever else you are in the world. Um, and uh, I wanted to um, add some, some remarks, which I hope will be brief as a compliment to what I showed in the film. Um, because for the film, I was obviously working on um, the exceptional works we have in the Clark's collection, but to sort of unpack the, the context in which these works uh, were made and to better understand the techniques available to artists in the period, I thought it might help to have some complementary um, images in mind. So um, I'm really looking forward to the discussion, but I wanted to just share a few more images with you all to help us understand uh, the very complex techniques that printmakers were employing in the 18th century uh, to create these virtuoso prints. So I'm going to share my screen. And all right, I believe you should be seeing my title slide now. Um, 
Okay, so um, first of all, I wanted to just show you all what an academy looks like. I referenced the academy as a several times as a genre of drawing that was essential to um, art making in 18th century France. All students who went through the Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture had to produce these and how good they were at producing these drawings determined actually where they got to sit in the drawing studio. Um, and it would eventually sort of determine their status in the academy and whether or not they got to go to Rome as artists such as Boucher and Fragonard had the opportunity to do. Um, and professors who, who taught at the academy were actually obliged during their month, annual month of teaching to leave behind an academic drawing such as this in red chalk with white highlights produced by Dumont called the Romain in 1742. And because of this, France, notably the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris has an outstanding massive collection of these academy drawings. But these were only available um, to people who were in Paris. Um, oh, and I wanted to show you sort of this beautiful drawing by Natoire, who, as you remember, was the person who had that red chalk drawing by Fragonard or Flagonard. Um, and he gives us a really sort of rich visual description of the hustle and bustle of the drawing studio at the academy, where um, students were vying for the best spot to view their figures. Um, but so these drawings were only available to people in Paris, which is one of the reasons why our friend Gilles de Marteau um, requested permission uh, in 1771 to reproduce these drawings at half the size um, in red um, using the, the Cran Manor engraving. So you can see the original drawing by Dumont on the left and on the right, um, you see uh, de Marteau's red, red chalk um, Cran Manor engraving, which he printed with, with red ink. Um, and you can see that he made some modifications, especially sort of in the development of um, a sort of a naturalizing and decorative background. And this would have been used, um, this, this, this print would have been consumed both by um, sort of curious connoisseurs, but also potentially by um, students in the provinces. Uh, and that's what um, French engraver Charles-Nicolas Cochin said was the only benefit of this new technique of printmaking was, was a pedagogical, um, was it their pedagogical value. Um, and that's something that we could perhaps discuss or debate would be sort of the, 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 the use, the virtue of, of making prints such as this. Um, so how were these prints made? I wanted to share a couple of, um, of diagrams from, from technical treatises produced in the 18th century to give you a sense um, of the kinds of tools that were used and the effects that they were supposed to produce. So um, th this, this technique was developed by um, Gilles de Marteau and by someone named Jean-Charles Jean Francois in the late 1750s. The two eventually had a falling out, but de Marteau had the particular approach of working closely with, with um, an inventor of optical instruments and mathematical tools named Alix Magny. And you can get kind of a sense in the upper left of this um, engraving um, from the Encyclopédie in 1767 of what these tools looked like. And um, we can see here in this detail, sort of um, the kinds of textures that these tools allowed a printmaker to produce. And um, in the Encyclopedia in 1767, this is what how, this is how they define Cran Manor engraving. They say it is the art of imitating or counterfeiting in copper, in copper drawings done in crayon on paper. The objective of this technique is to create an illusion such that on first inspection, the connoisseur cannot make out the difference between the original drawing and the print. I'm really intrigued by this term counterfeit as it was used um, in literature of the period. And then just the second plate that I'm showing you um, is from a 1770 re-edition of a 17th century treatise on etching by Abraham Boss. And um, this shows even more tools. We see sort of, again, the techniques that the tools were supposed to uh, facilitate. And at the bottom, you can see in small writing, Bonnet sculpts it, which means this, this diagram was made by um, Louis, um, Louis Bonnet. And as we'll see at the end of, of the slides I'm about to show, Bonnet was a real pioneer in printmaking techniques in the 18th century. Um, so again, we just get a close up of some of this wonderful texture and sort of the original tools that printmakers were, um, were inventing in this period. 
Um, and finally, I just want to give you know a, a brief sort of historical context to where um, sort of the the market from which these techniques emerged. We have um, several prints in the Clark collection from the Pequay Cosa, which was one of the first um, editorial endeavors um, launched to reproduce uh, reproduce drawings in print. And you can see that in these um, sort of the 1729 edition. Um, on the left, and then the later 1763 re-edition on the right, that different techniques were being deployed. So this is a reproduction of um, a drawing by Raphael, now in the Albertina, that was in the 18th century in the collection uh, of a French collector. Um, and, oops, let me go back. Um, on the left, you have um, a combination of chiaroscuro woodcut technique with etching, and on the right, you have a combination of aquatint, which is a very, very new novel uh, technique with, with etching. So you can see that, that printmakers and editors are constantly revisiting and trying to improve the techniques used to reproduce drawings because people really wanted to see drawings. Um, and then just, I wanted to give you some sort of uh, background. I, I talked about the, the Ricoy of Julienne. You can see Julienne in this beautiful portrait holding um, a drawing um, uh, thought to be possibly a self-portrait by Watteau of himself. Um, and this gets reproduced as sort of a, a frontispiece, but also sort of a freely circulating um, print um, as a part of the Recoy Julienne. Um, and you can see it here. Um, it was reproduced by our friend Boucher. And you can see this really fascinating detail on the drawing portfolio that Watteau is holding. Um, on the left, you see in small letters under his fingers, under the artist's fingers, Watteau. But on the right of the portfolio, you can also see Boucher. So this is kind of a daring insertion of authorship on the part of Boucher, um, who, as we remember, uh, did hundreds of the etchings for the Recoy Julien project. So I thought this was sort of an interesting image mm -hmm. to share. And then um, this, uh, the, the woman in black in the Clark collection at right, you can see this etching um, from the Met. This is uh, Boucher's reproduction and etching of the drawing. You can see the format changes a little bit and it is now in reverse as often happens in prints made after drawings. Uh, but you can see that while we, that certain things, um, namely sort of the texture and color and tone of the chalk get lost in the etching process, which, and therein lies the interest of inventing these new techniques. And finally, I wanted to share with you one of just the most um, outstanding um, and inventive examples of print in the 18th centuries. This is Louis, Louis Bonnet's um, Tête de Flore, um, Head of Flora, after Francois Boucher. And um, this is done in a technique called pastel manner engraving. And something that is really fascinating, this is something that you can look at online on your own because this whole manuscript is digitized on Gallica, the BNF's digital platform. Um, he, he sort of compiled um, a manuscript in which he showed every step that it took to build up this incredibly rich and colorful um, print that imitated pastel. So you have, you start with blue and then you layer in the red and then you add sort of a blue green, you add the blacks, the yellows, um, you conclude with white until you get the image, the final image on the right here. Um, so the fact that this manuscript exists also sort of exemplifies the self-awareness on the part of these printmakers that they were really sort of pushing the boundaries of their, of their field. And just, just wanted to share this delicious detail to give you a sort of insight into how incredibly um, rich this, this, the, the results of this technique were. And finally, I wanted to mention one more uh, technique that was used in the 18th century, that of wash manner etching. So on the left, um, you have a drawing by the artist Hubert Robert. And on the right, you have what's called um, a wash manner aquatint or wash manner engraving um, by his dear friend and supporter, uh, saint um, And you can see that this technique really, um, it, was, it was sort of invented and mobilized because of this interest in reproducing drawing techniques. And it's, it's honestly really quite successful. So this uses um, this basically uh, to, to make 
um, this kind of print um, varnish is put on um, on a copper plate, and then um, acid is painted on to this varnish to sort of eat away at it and eat away at the copper plate to create areas of tone. And then the artist can go back and do this using different tools and various techniques to create the resulting impression. And this pair um, of the, this drawing in this print will actually appear in the um, exhibition we have coming up um, in December, Promenades on Paper, 18th Century French Drawings from the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. So I wanted to conclude with a little plug for that show. Um, and then just I uh, wanted to conclude with some of my favorite resources for learning more about um, these print techniques in this phenomenon of printing in color after drawings in the 18th century. So that's all I have for the slides. And at this point, I'm happy to take questions um, from Anne and from the audience. Wonderful, Sarah. Thanks so much for that additional um, insight and expansion into our understanding. Uh, into a, it, what can be a very technical subject. Um, you brilliantly anticipated one of the questions in our queue, which was the uh, were the dates for the BANF exhibition. So <laughs> we're already, we got a head start on the questions and, and there are some rolling in, um, but I was thinking I, 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 if, before I get to those, I'm gonna um, kind of cut in the line if I may and ask you a question of my own. Um, uh, so, and that has to do with, I guess the, um, you mentioned that the, the way that these prints, uh, print techniques were developed so often in a way that would be imitative of drawings to the point of a even deceptive ends, right? So I was wondering whether, what was the Academy's feeling about these print techniques that were designed for the reproduction of drawings? Were they endorsed by the Academy? Were these print techniques like Cram Manor and others, were they actually taught as part of the academy curriculum or was it more uh, an outsider's realm of, did you have to go to specialists or amateurs to really get your chops in, in, in those media? Um, that's such a wonderful question. It has kind of a complicated answer um, in that the academy's response was not totally uniform or, or univocal. It feels like on the one hand, they were very dismissive of these efforts on the part of printmakers. Um, and you see that in the comments by um, uh, Charles-Nicolas Cochin, who was a member of the Royal Academy. And you could be a member of the Royal Academy as a printmaker, but you did not have the same status as a sculptor or as a painter. But Cochin thought, oh, these seem kind of a little silly. So this is just a curiosity for the connoisseur and okay, perhaps it could serve a pedagogical end. Um, another place we see this sort of dismissiveness on the part of the academy, which had so much power in France in terms of determining the success um, and visibility of artists uh, was the fact that um, de Marteau delivered, who, who was a member um, of the academy actually himself, and I'll, I'll get back to that. Um, he, he delivered a, a lecture to the academy um, trying to uh, request their official protection of the technique of Cran Manor engraving. Mm -hmm. um, so he was sort of touting the virtues and the value of this new technique. And his um, his pleading kind of fell on deaf ears because they never went, you know, they never went to the trouble then of um, uh, of sort of protecting or giving him a privilege, a royal privilege mm -hmm. for practicing his technique, which meant mm -hmm. it was open season and anyone could do it. Um, <laughs> Did he try anywhere else to get a sort of patent or some sort of recognition for that invention, or was it just he just had to um, deal with all the all the uh, that's that's the only that's the only episode of which I know, but it would certainly be interesting to dig further and figure out if there are any trace of, of other attempts um, on his part. Um, doesn't that just tell us so much, though, about the value placed on printmaking versus drawing or drawing versus printmaking at the time? I mean, there was yeah. just no question of an equal status. That's, and that's something that just fascinates me in general in in the period. Um, I mean, both the the Academy of Painting and Sculpture. The, um, the Academy of Architecture and also the, the Academy of Sciences were so dependent on printmakers and the print trade for the visibility and circulation of the, the work that they produced. And yet um, 
I, th- I think so we still- it was just seen as too utilitarian, right? It didn't have enough of an artistic um, cachet, I suppose, at least yeah. in the period. I mean, I think that's because um, invention was such a key part of an artist's identity in the period. So for example, I mean, Anne, I, I know you <laughs> know this, but for, for the benefit of our audience, um, um, in order to win this prize to go to Rome, um, all the students were given the same subject, usually a historical subject to depict. Um, and whoever came up with the most sort of inventive depiction of that um, historical event was, was given the prize. I mean, techn- their, their sort of style and technique were also considered, but um, th- they were supposed to be creative in terms of the images they produced, not just how they were executed. But um, just to say one more thing about sort of the status of um, Crayon Manor engraving in the Academy, sort of funnily enough, um, Gilles de Marteau's acceptance, his acceptance piece um, to the Academy, the print he submitted to be inducted into the Academy was a Cran Manor print. Is that um, right? Oh, yeah, amazing. and this was of um, a drawing after, um, I believe he made this print after, um, I believe a drawing by Cochin himself. So oh. <laughs> that was a well calculated <laughs> yeah, Very well calculated. He knew who was suspect of his, um, of his, of his techniques. So, so yeah, that is to say, definitely. Well, flattery, um, flattery will take you far, right? <laughs> yeah, <been> now. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrific. Well, well, thank you for that. Um, so with that, I'll turn to some of the questions that have um, come in and I'll encourage all our uh, attendees to um, be, not to be shy about typing in those questions. Um, so let's see, starting with, um, Here's a question about um, putting these 18th century techniques in perspective relative to the recent Clark exhibition, oh, my exhibition, on uh, 19th century printmaking, hue and cry, French printmaking, and the ba- debate over color. So perhaps you and I are yeah. a little well, joint answer to that question. <laughs> you should start though. Uh, I'll start, okay. Um... Well, I think if you've if you visited Anne's um, beautiful exhibition, which which recently concluded, um, in part due to the sensitive nature of color prints, color prints are very light sensitive, so it's not a show that you could have up for an entire year. Unfortunately, <laughs> to reduce their exposure to a, a brief period of time, um, the the show. Um, began with an introduction to 18th century reproductive print techniques, which included um, the not the exact Quesa prints that I was the enunciation, the enunciation, mm-hmm. which I which I, the exact same point that you did. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and then um, let's see. Anyway, Anne can talk about how she sort of mm-hmm. developed um, sort of her thinking behind um, the selection for that show. And actually, funnily enough, this, this film was shot while Hue and Cry was up. So uh, by nature of you know the space-time continuum, anything that I was looking at in the Manton Center was not um, <laughs> on view at Hue and Cry. <laughs> That's a really um, good point. That's a really good point. I was also teaching a class at that time uh, on you know various aspects of, <clears throat> excuse me, of European printmaking. And our last session, uh, was supposed to be all about the rise of color printmaking. And of course, all the, well, I mean, I say all the best works were in the exhibition, but we had still had plenty left over to, to have a discussion about that in class based on objects. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the sort of the simple answer to the question is um, that the, the real, Im- the impetus um, for imitation of color as Sarah just just beautifully showed us in her talk, in the, particularly in the video, was very much as a way of imitating what was most valued uh, in pastel draw, drawings or colored chalk drawings, which was their freshness and their vitality. And we saw in the video how that the addition of red chalk, for example, even to a simple black and white chalk drawing, adds so much in the way of just character and liveliness and uh, almost like flesh and blood. And so it was many of those same um, desires to have accurate imitation of, of color drawings that led to this burst of innovation in color printmaking. And I, it really is traceable to the 18th century. Um, and what I showed in the exhibition was that after this great flowering uh, in the late 18th century, 
there's a long hiatus. Interestingly, there's a sort of reaction against color. Now that didn't say that other forms of reproductive printmaking in black and white didn't didn't flourish during the 19th century, but there was a sort of um, return to this conservative idea that um, print should be an art of black and white and that color was either suspect or just completely out of bounds. Uh, but that changes then again in the end of the 19th century when uh, French printmakers, at least uh, en ma not en masse, but in larger numbers, uh, return to that, um, to that um, spirit of the innovation um, within the realm of color printmaking. So um, that, that's, that's, that's our question number one. And, and we'll move on because there are more coming in. Um, there is a question about saying, um, thank you for sharing your research. I'm curious, was crayon engraving more reliant on the roulette versus the burin? Was there a preference? And were these crayon engravings, um, I suppose the, the ones that you showed or others of the period, were they subjected to acid uh, as in an etching? Um, so yes, I, you're picking up on probably a, a, a semantic slippage on my part. There was both Crayon Manor engraving and Crayon Manor etching both were practiced. And um, sounds like our uh, the person who posed the questions knows a little bit about the difference between engraving and etching. Um, in engraving, the line is forged directly on the copper plate using a baron, which um, removes um, uses sort of a groove to remove um, copper material. And into this groove, ink is deposited, and that's the line that you see when you print onto paper from the plate. And etching is a little bit different. You could say it requires a little bit less muscle mm -hmm. in that um, there is um, a ground um, applied to the surface of the, of the copper plate into which um, an artist will take an, an etching needle or various other tools. They'll scrape away that, um, that, that varnish or that ground the whole plate is then put in an acid bath and wherever the ground was removed, the acid will sort of eat that line. So the acid does the work of forging that line. Now this, um, this could be, the same principle was used in Cran Manor engraving and etching. So you could use these two throughlets and these styluses and various instruments either directly on the plate or on, um, or on a ground. Um, so um, in terms of whether a burin or, um, uh, roulette was privileged. I would say, broadly speaking, these, these sort of novel tools were privileged because these ha imparted the texture that imitated sort of the, the greasy deposits of crayon as they were left in an irregular manner on sort of the toothy paper that was made in, in, in 18th century France. Um, so there was the roulette, but there are also all these other sort of funny tools that had little spiky ends to them, which you you saw um, hopefully in the diagram. Um, so yeah, the, the burin was not the most useful tool to, to the process of crayon man mirror engraving and etching. Yeah, yeah, that, that sounds uh, absolutely right. And, and plus it was sort of the engraving was the sort of the old, uh, the old ancestor, right? The, the, as you said, the novel uh, tools and techniques were the ones that probably got the most um, play uh, or publicity at the time. Uh, we have another technique question actually, um, asking about uh, how the printmaker begins or began with the mark making on the plate. Uh, did the printmaker employ a grid system, for example, to accurately replicate the scale, placement of figures, et cetera, of the drawing? So it's about the transfer from one um, medium to the print matrix. Right. So, so this is um, such a fascinating question and one to which I think we have um, sort of partial insight. Um, sometimes grid techniques were used for transfer. It would often sort of depend on the scale of the original work being, um, being replicated. So what might happen, let's say if a large painting were being reproduced is an intermediary drawing would be made um, and, and grids would be used to facilitate that reduction in size. Um, when a print was being interpreted at actual size, uh, a, a um, grid system was probably less necessary, but what was often done um, was a copy of um, the original drawing would have been made um, using, often using, for, for crayon um, drawings, you could make a counterproof. 
Um, and that would, what that would do is, well, so what a counterproof is, is you put sort of um, a humid sheet on top of the, the chalk drawing and you can put it through a press. And what you get when you separate the two sheets is um, an exact copy of the original drawing in reverse. So a printmaker might work from that co copy. And the benefit of that is that um, when they copied the copy, <laughs> when they that what they printed would actually be in the right orientation. I know this is sort of confusing, but um, printmaking, uh, if you don't insert reversal into how you draw on the plate, then whatever you print will be in reverse of, of, of the original. Um, so that was a technique that was used. And then sometimes you can see on surviving drawings and various collections, you can see, um, especially sort of on the back, you can see that, um, a printmaker took um, a stylus to a drawing and would 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 um, or would maybe rub the back of a drawing in red chalk and then put the print on top of their plate and and sort of very carefully use sort of a metal implement to draw the contours of what they were transferring. And then when they would lift it up, you would have those transferred contours on the plate. So it's um, yeah, there are different techniques. And we because of sort of the ephemeral and and nature of, of anything that has to do with the artistic process, a lot of it doesn't get preserved or is gets destroyed in the productive process. It's those examples are rarer than we would like. Yeah, no, that that's so true. And it's a reminder how uh, not just complex, but sort of a mucky business <laughs> printmaking is so many steps. Um, and some of them, yeah, some, some of them more complex than others, but always accounting for the reversal. And I mean, I just love in your video the the remark about the de Marteau sort of going to the trouble actually of reversing his own uh, drawn strokes on that plate to make sure that they were lined up properly for a sharp eye viewer um, of, the, of the print copy. <laughs> Um, great. All right. So moving along, let's see, we had going back to the little bit, the, um, the issue of the status of printmaking. Um, I've had a question about uh, wondering whether printmaking was simply too democratic uh, of an art to be given a special place among the arts taught by the Academy. What's your feeling on that, Sarah? Um, I, I guess I would sort of uh, to a degree sort of repeat sort of the ethos of what I said earlier is that um, the the democracy of printmaking was was celebrated by academics and by artists who belong to the academy and all of their supporters. So even um, sort of late 17th, early 18th century theor theoreticians such as Roger de Pille said of a reproductive print, What's amazing is that any um, anyone can unfurl a print on their desk and have access to some of the greatest works that are in far flung corners of the world and to which they otherwise would not have access. So there's an acknowledgement of this um, democratic value. Um, and at the same time, the the people who are at the top of the food chain in the academy hmm. are um, are history painters. So so painters who specialize in painting biblical, mythological, and uh, historical subjects. But that's not to say that in the 18th century, I think um, something you see is sort of an efflorescence of artists who are painters who have a great deal of status and success, who also are printmakers themselves. Um, that's uh, this in the 19th century, they, they, well, maybe this term exists in the 18th century, but I'm thinking um, at the very, the very latest of the 19th century, you have this term peintre graveur, a painter engraver. Um, Fragonard himself um, and Boucher, as we saw, was um, an energetic etcher. And etching, because it was a little bit easier physically than engraving, um, you could be a little bit more spontaneous, loosey-goosey with etching than you could with engraving. Um, that technique was favored um, by artists. And then you see um, all sorts of fascinating experiments by, by 19th century French painters from Manet in lithography and Degas in monotype who, who sort of pushed this even further. So um, yeah, I guess in the, in the, even already in the 18th century, you see artists also aware of how they can make money from prints after mm -hmm. their works. So they're interested in it, um, even if 
the official royal status is less than that of painters and sculptors. Terrific. Um, see a few more questions coming in. Oh, well, actually a lot more. Um, uh, so, and one has to do with, uh, we haven't talked too much about the circulation of these prints beyond France, prints and techniques, but could you say a bit about their international circulation? They did circulate internationally. Um, and they, they did circulate internationally um, and tracing all of the places to which they circulated um, would require a really sort of studying and accounting for surveying collections the world over. I can say from personal experience and, and sort of firsthand knowledge that um, these prints were snapped up in England um, and they definitely made their way to the Netherlands, Germany, um, and to the Italian peninsula. Um, they surely went um, on the boats of uh, sort of sent by the Compagnie des Andes with Jesuit missionaries, with traders, uh, with colonial settlers the world over. So prints are definitely caught up in the extent of France's empire. Um, and I guess I would just point you towards a really fascinating study published by a colleague of mine, um, Aaron Hyman. I think the title of the book is Rubens. I'm going to get the title wrong, but I think it's Rubens on repeat. Um, mm -hmm. Please for, forgive me if anyone in the comments wants to give me the, the correct title, but it's yeah, recently to Google published. it. <laughs> yeah, you can Google it. Um, um, it's published by the Getty Research Institute, which obviously does all of the best things for works on paper. And anyway, Aaron's book mm -hmm. is about the reception of Rubens in the Hispanic New World through print. So this mm -hmm. is definitely um, a horizon of research for scholars to think about how um, European art was uh sort of disseminated and received and processed in parts of the world that we might not, um, you know, initially consider, so. Yeah, and it is great that um, researchers now and scholars are looking beyond those European borders that um, used to sort of set limits on our study of print circulation and are now, um, you know, getting, giving us a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, well, let's see. We have if, uh, maybe a couple more questions that we have time for. Um, like one here is about publishers. So, were there sort of um, identifiable publishers we know of who were regularly relied upon to print for uh, these printmaker artists, or is that a is is that something we don't know as much about? Um, that's something we know quite a bit about, actually. Um, thanks to the dogged research of especially many French art historians and historians who've published entire dictionaries of French editors and publishers. Um, much of the, of the printmaking trade in, in Paris in the 17th and 18th century happened on the Rue Saint-Jacques. It was just uh, a street packed full of, of printers. And I should say that um, the various steps in the printmaking process were very much separated and we're getting back into hierarchy here. So, you know, there's the, there's, there's often the, the, the artist or draftsman who would produce the original image. And then there would be the printmaker who would translate that into etching, engraving, crane manner engraving, you name it. Um, it was not often that a printmaker would actually print their own work. Often there would, that, that was a whole nother specialty. Uh, copper, the copper plate printer was responsible for inking, wiping, and printing those prints. And then um, an editor would, or um, an editor or libraire would sell, um, sell the prints. So one of the more famous um, um, print sellers and editors in 18th century France as a, as a person named Ukier, for example. And, and um, you know, we know a fair a bit about, you know, we know where he was lodged, where he, from where he sold things. We know things about his inventory. Um, so, so yes, it's, that's actually something we know a fair, fair bit about. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we have, maybe this will be the um, final question unless um, anyone wants to chime in. Um, in just the next minute or so. Um, I, I hope that I'll um, understand it correctly. It says, did these, these academics, I, I assume like the academic, maybe the gatekeepers of, uh, or the, the ones enforcing the, 
the place of history at the top of the hierarchy, did they produce and or supervise art themselves? And they were practicing artists who um, favored history as a genre for, for the reasons that you, you talked about. But um, yeah, the, the, the question is, did these history academics tend to produce and or supervise art themselves? So maybe, maybe it's a question about the, the position of uh, you know, those at the top of the academic hierarchy versus producing artists who were, who were reliant more on commissions for a living. Yeah, that's um, the answer to that question is 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 complicated. Um, I would answer it in a couple parts. So first of all, um, members of the academy who were fully, um, you know, who were full participants who achieved full status, were were also teachers, right? So um, this is sort of a funny a funny fact, um, but the life drawing was kind of the only, one of the only things that happened at the Louvre in the actual halls of the academy. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, in the case of Dumont, uh, professors were obliged to teach life drawing for you know, one month out of every year. <laughs> now, the actual teaching of, um, of, of, let's just say painting, would happen in the artist's private studio. Um, so you would you would want to get into a good atelier, right? Um, um, so that was something that happened alongside instruction at the academy, but was also a little bit separate and perhaps less uh, closely supervised. And a lot of these artists had lodging at the Louvre um, itself. Um, it's kind of a wild thing to imagine that this royal palace artists and artisans had workshops and sometimes lived there with their families, but um, printmakers too often had lodging at the Louvre. But this was in fact the case. As to um, how this um, affected the seriousness with which various genres were taken, um, I mean, so you could you could you could be a specialist. You would be inducted as a specialist in a variety of genres. History painting being at the top. Um, you also had painters who specialized in portraits, landscape, animal painting, um, and still life. Still life, dead nature, inanimate subjects being at the bottom. Um, and and students could could you know enter or choose to study with with any of these. Artists, but we just we just know um, from, for example, the fact that the Prix de Rome, the subject was never a bowl of oranges. It was always, you know, something from the Old Testament. We know we know that <laughs> the official, um, and this goes back to the 17th century, that the officially um, sort of preferred and most celebrated genre was history painting because it was supposed to. It, it exemplified the artist's erudition too, that they had an intellectual command of, uh, of literature and of history. Um, it was not sort of a direct transposition of nature. And for that reason, it was thought to be sort of a higher um, art form. Um, and this was just, this was, this was something that lasted through the demise of the Royal Academy um, um, during the French Revolution, even, you know, at the same time as artists um, such as Boucher and Fragonard were also doing genre painting and portraits and, um, you know, creating all of these sort of decorative subjects because of the financial interest of working outside of history painting. So, you know, history paintings would often be sort of showed at the official, shown at the official salon and they would be purchased by dukes and princes and princesses and wealthy financiers, but also people wanted all sorts of subjects to, to fill their cabinets and decorate their homes. So that's, um, that's a whole nother topic about the amateur class of we'll collectors stop. and the rise of sort of a commercial art market in the way that's right. more akin to what we think of today. But yeah, that was sort of emerging uh, at that very moment of the 18th yeah. century. Well, what a wonderful, I mean, yes, this opens out to so, so many different issues. It's thanks to your, your talk and presentation that we've been able to touch on all these different aspects. So thank you again, Sarah. It, sounds, it seems like a, a great place to wrap it up. There's just a Final question of a more practical nature, which is, is there a place where I might find a list of the books and references presented here today? And so what I can say to that is that uh, um, for one thing, we'll have a recording of 
this event on our website, uh, available on Clark Connects, um, probably within the next week or so. Um, and I also just, um, I'm just being very um, mm -hmm. nifty here. I'm, I copied and pasted it into the chat. So lovely. Okay, so that's um, your so slide. Okay. <laughs> um, I think that means you'll have about 30 seconds to copy and paste it yourself <laughs> before the. Uh, I'll have to be as nifty session. as you, Sarah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and just put it and getting those references, but and of course in a in a. In, in any other oh, case, we okay. can also, we have your email addresses if you registered for the talk. So um, we can also probably find you um, and get those references to you. Cause there were some also you mentioned orally that, that might, might be of interest. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. There's a comment coming in now saying great presentation. Thank you. And I'm sure that's echoed by everyone on the call. So um, really enjoyed speaking with you here today. And um, thank you all of you who joined uh, for the presentation. As I said, we'll be posting the video of this, um, if, if you want to go back to anything or share it with folks who may have missed it and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Anne.